If you haven't seen the previous video in this series, follow the link on your screen or click the link in the description or pinned comment below. Marty has a watch. What time did he think it was when he was visiting Doc Brown's garage? He clearly can't blame his lateness on the silly clock experiment. Notice how there isn't a 37 seconds of logo sin, even though there are 37 seconds of logos? I just thought I'd point that out, considering the small but annoying tangent of people that come here to say that Jeremy removes sins for short logos because they've done it once or twice as a response to criticism. You know, like how racist people start talking about their black friends in an attempt at deflection. My point is that they didn't use to do this, but now every video seems to start off with it and it's f***ing annoying. Just get to the actual sins. <laughs> See what I did there? Anyway, when does the movie suggest that Marty is blaming his lateness on Doc's clocks? All he says in this scene is, damn, I'm late for school. I wear a watch all the time. I can only know the time if I look at it. Take your time. You'll get what I'm saying. Mountain Dew Hat clearly already knows that Marty is on the back of the Jeep, but reacts to it again like he's noticing him for the first time further down the road. What is actually occurring here is a man reacting to a kid using his car to skateboard. He looks at him multiple times because... Well, what would you do if someone did this? Look at them once and then forget about it? If he breaks too hard, he could literally kill him. Also, Mountain Dew Hat. Jeremy points out things on the screen cliche. What? What? Hill Valley is a small town, but they support every American's right to sit in a theater and watch a porno movie 24 hours a day right there in the town square. And what could be more American than watching porn? Where do you think the majority of OnlyFans subscribers come from? Actually, the majority of OnlyFans subscribers comes from India. Also, orgy American style. Hey man, when it's an orgy, I don't think anyone's instilled with a sense of nationalism. See, if CinemaSins was cool, they'd point out that orgy American style was an actual pornographic film where one of the actors of that film was in Back to the Future. It also starred Sharon Kelly, and no, I'm not telling you to go Google who that is and watch a few scenes. Biff just happens to be my supervisor. It's really hard to believe that the bully Biff entered the same line of work as nerdy George McFly and ended up being his supervisor. When one suggests that someone is a nerd, usually the implication is that they're intelligent or at least smarter than the average person. And of course, since you're implying that Biff shouldn't be his supervisor, that's exactly what you mean. Now, I don't know if you've actually paid attention to this series, but since when has George McFly demonstrated that he's a nerd or that he shouldn't be a subordinate of Biff? It's like, dude, do you even back to the future? I guess you missed the scenes where Biff bullied George into doing his work for him. Hello? Think McFly, I mean Jeremy. Three pens to make George look extra nerdy in this shot, two pens to make him look a third less nerdy in the next shot. That might have something to do with the fact that George took the pen out to use it. Uncle Jailbird Joy? He's your brother, Mom. Thanks, Dave, for clearing up the relationship between your uncle and your mother. Obviously, this is a jab at the movie telling the audience about a relationship the character should be privy to. There are, however, two problems with this. The first is obvious. Their uncle could have been their father's brother. The second is that people actually talk like this, especially when the context is that the family doesn't want to be associated with a criminal member of that family. You know, the context of this scene? He's saying he's your brother, mom, as a response to her suggesting that they should all call him. But I could see how you can miss something that requires paying attention. This grand appearance by Doc Brown in his DeLorean is pretty great, but it's also unlikely, considering that the DeLorean has these vertical opening doors. It would have been impossible for Doc to get into the car while it was in the truck, so he would have had to use his remote to get the car out of the truck, get into the car on the outside, drive it back into the truck, and then, just for the purpose of impressing Marty, drive it back out. But he's not even doing it to impress Marty because he doesn't even know he's here yet. So CinemaSense believes that it's impossible for a DeLorean's doors to open inside a truck. I'm going to allow Kenneth Strode to answer this one. The myth. You need a lot of room between a DeLorean and another car to open the DeLorean's doors. Well, 
We're about to find out. <gasps> oh, don't open that door. It might hit the car next to it. Oh, it's not hitting. How come? Because it's a DeLorean. That's why. Right. So everyone so, that thinks that you can't open a DeLorean door. There's still more than three inch clearance there. What about next to a wall? Oh, I'm too close to this wall. I might not even be able to get out. Wow, that's what I call tight. That is. Good, open the door. Okay, see now you got about one inch. Yep. So, proof is in the pudding. Why are these flames on the road that are clearly touching Doc and Marty not burning them? Because it's a poorly done special effect in a movie from the mid-80s? I mean, in-universe, those flames aren't touching them. So is this a doylist or Watsonian sin? Do you really think Jeremy knows what those terms even mean? You're talking to a guy that giggles like a schoolgirl at the word cloaca. Oh, we have to, because Kermit the Frog, because he is a frog, yep. has a cloaca. <laughs> God damn it. Alright. Let me say that again. He has a what? Right. A, a what? I want to hear it again. <laughs> Kermit, but Kermit the Frog, <laughs> by definition, <laughs> as a frog, has a cloaca. <laughs> cloaca. Einstein could see the Libyan national bus at a great distance, and they didn't even have their headlights on. That's probably because Einstein is a dog, and a dog's hearing is something like two times better than ours. I mean, did you seriously suggest that a dog needs to see headlights in order to know a van is coming? What the hell do you think dogs do in the daytime? Just not react to vehicles? They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. Yeah, I'm with you, Doc. Maybe they could have tracked you down to Hill Valley, but how did they figure out to go to Twin Pines Mall at 1.30 in the morning to come find you? I don't understand why you think this is a valid question. Clearly, within the confines of the film, the Libyans acquired intel on Doc and figured he'd be here. How they did this simply isn't important to the story the movie is trying to tell, or else they'd have told you. There are plenty of ways they could have found him. Doc made a phone call to his own house telling Marty the location and time. It's entirely possible they were spying on him and figured it out then. But even still, did not having this information make this a bad movie? Oh. Also, he drove through the open door of the barn, meaning his car should be facing away from the Peabody's when they come to investigate. And even if he came from another direction, there appears to be no openings behind the car. That's called perspective, Jeremy. In this shot, you cannot see directly behind the car. In any case, the DeLorean entered this bar from the rear, and the Peabody's opened the door to the side of the barn. This is why when Marty escapes, he blasts through another set of doors. The side doors. Inky black of night to early morning sunrise in a matter of seconds. And then it's a totally sunny day in absolutely no time. It's amazing that a grown man doesn't understand the passage of time. He honestly believes that this movie is in real time, like 24. Great, you're alive. A phone book listing does not prove whether someone is dead or alive. No, but it does prove that he was born by this time, which is how Marty meant it. Besides, if Doc exists in this time, then this does prove that he's alive, considering Marty went back in time. It's a good thing Lou doesn't take a look at the money Marty gives him. He might find some years that don't exist yet. Yeah, but who the hell is looking at the years on pocket change besides some weirdo collector? Actually, that's, uh, that's John F. Kennedy Drive. Who the hell is John F. Kennedy? Obviously, the road didn't exist in 1955, and it's obviously one of those ha-ha, back in 1955, people didn't know how famous John F. Kennedy would be type of jokes, but Marty's grandfather says, who the hell is John F. Kennedy? As if you're supposed to be familiar with the name of anyone a road is named after. I see we're on a whole new level of bullshit with this one. If someone uses the full name of a person a street was named after, the person they're speaking to will instantly think of one of two things. The person whose name that is, or the location specifically. Clearly, Marty's grandfather doesn't know either. Hence the question. I'm gonna ramble! Geez, I knew Biff was a bully, but not like a homicidal one. Wait, was that it? That was the sin? That you don't believe bullies can be homicidal? You're aware Biff tried to smoke Marty in the second movie, right? Dude, that's your mom. Although, it's a young Leah Thompson, so I don't know if I can blame you. Jeremy would pork his mom if she were hot. The most telegraphed punch in history somehow lands on Biff's face. He deserved it, but damn, the punch George tried to throw earlier wasn't nearly as telegraphed, and he stopped that one perfectly fine. Yes, because if Back to the Future teaches you anything, it's that when an event occurs twice, exactly the same thing happens the second time. Right. Scram, McFly. It's actually kind of amazing after George socked Biff that this red-headed stepchild comes in and steals Lorraine from him. 
After the adrenaline rush of beating up the biggest bully in school, who's gonna stop you now? Yeah, but I mean, if a woman goes away with another guy, what are you gonna do? Beat the shit out of the other guy and take her back? That's how Future Birdman caught his case. And I'd do it again because that joint was fat, son. Am I on the mic? Why am I on the mic? This is actually a great scene and one of my favorites in movie history, but since we know George is gonna come back and push this dumbass off Lorraine, and we know he's gonna kiss her, why would Marty's existence still be in danger? Does George have to kiss Lorraine at the exact moment he did in the first timeline? George makes the decision on his own, so this would have happened no matter what. No, because this movie is explicitly telling you that the kiss is what was needed for the future to happen. Damn, dude, do you honestly know nothing about women? Seriously, a kiss will tell them all they need to know about you. Let's do another one! Suddenly, Marvin is excited about doing another number with Marty, even though he screwed up most of Earth Angel. Considering Marty finished the song strong and the fact that Marvin doesn't have a guitarist, do I even need to finish this sentence? Marty, such a nice name. But you decided to name your first son Dave anyway. Yeah, she probably thought Dave was slightly nicer. It's whatever, big whoops. Look at the time! You got less than four minutes! But don't worry, that's just movie time. I know what you guys are thinking. Where the f <laughs> was the sin here? I don't have any answers. I just wanted to point out that I knew what you were thinking. I got all the time I want. I got a time machine. I can just go back early and warn him. Okay. 10 minutes ought to do it. You're giving yourself 10 minutes to tell Doc he's gonna get shot? Why not an hour? Or a day? As long as you don't run into yourself, you should be fine. You're asking a stressed out character why they made a snap decision while under duress. If you think about it, it's fairly realistic. He knows Doc is going to get shot by the Libyans, so thinking on his feet, he thought of going to a little bit before that moment in order to save his friend. Remember, throughout this entire sequence, Doc has been refusing to listen to Marty's warning about the future, so there's no guarantee future Doc would listen to him either, even if he went back a day. Car suddenly goes dead when you most need it, cliche. I mean... It was a DeLorean. I know, people like these cars because of this movie, but DeLoreans were awful cars that broke down near constantly. There is a reason DMC went out of business in only seven years, is what I'm saying. Geez, how many things does this car have to crash into before it shows any damage whatsoever? You're aware DeLoreans are made out of steel, right? I'm not saying they're indestructible, but crashing into particle board ain't gonna do shit. Oh, Brett. Is that former Mayor Red Thomas on the park bench? He looked kind of old back in 1955, and 30 years have passed since then. Shouldn't he be, like, really old? Or be dead by now? No, because the mayor and the bum are two different characters played by two different actors. Here's another thing Marty's time travel adventure affected. The Libyan National Bus now has their headlights on. That's just chaos theory working its magic. Well, yeah, there are other things that changed as well, like when Marty ran over the pine tree in Peabody's front yard, it changed the name of the mall from Twin Pines to Lone Pine. Welcome to the butterfly effect. Okay, so he took the precaution of wearing a bulletproof vest, which probably shouldn't have worked against an AK-47 at that range anyway, but he didn't change anything else. The location or time where he would be shot or stealing plutonium from the Libyan nationals in the first place? You'd think that in 30 years he might have come up with another power source for his DeLorean anyway. But it's kind of smart to keep things as they were up until this moment. If the Libyans think that he's dead, they'll obviously leave him alone and he'll get the DeLorean scot-free. Which brings us to this point in the movie. The whole living room is different from what Marty remembers which probably means a lot of things Marty remembers never happened, and his whole life would be different. Yet his other self is still apparently the same guy, with the same experiences, who still hangs out with Doc Brown and finds himself in a time machine going back to 1955. It's arguable the whole world would be different, since he interacted with a lot of people and not just his parents. It's also arguable you have to keep time travel simple, or else you lose your entire audience and you don't become the biggest hit of 1985. Still a sin. We never said we were happy about that shit. Doc already explains this in the second movie. Once someone goes back in time and changes something, they never actually change the future of the timeline they were originally from. They instead create a branching timeline. Marty, let's call him Marty 1, is currently in timeline 2, a timeline he created by going back to 1955. Once the events of the second film take place, Doc 2 and Marty 1 will create another timeline, this time timeline 3. This means that Marty 1 retains all his memories from his original timeline, Timeline 1. Marty 2 has gone back in time at this point, and that Marty is the one with the memories of this timeline. Yeah, what, what are you wearing, Dave? Marty, I always wear a suit to the office. And you still live with your parents? I know you're Generation X, Jeremy, but that was real boomer of you. I mean, you just shit on Koreans and Mexicans. Well, Mom, we talked about this, but how can I go to the lake? The car's wrecked. Nobody asks Marty why he thought the car was wrecked when it clearly wasn't. What the fuck? Jeremy is literally saying nobody is questioning Marty about the car over footage of them clearly questioning Marty about the car. 
How do you keep getting away with this? Now, Beth, don't con me. Let this be a lesson, kids. When you punch a bully, that bully becomes a total pussy later. CinemaSins treats the truth as a sin. Both you and Jennifer turn out fine. And your girlfriend turns into Elizabeth Shue, and your dad is completely unrecognizable. Hey, did you know? Recasting characters is a sin. Why? Because f you, that's why. Kids, Marty. Something has got to be done about your kids. You don't have to go back to 2015 to fix things, right? Can't you just tell them in 1985 so they'll remember later? Or give them an envelope they can't open until 2015? Dude, did you even watch Back to the Future 2? The plan was to have this Marty pose as Marty 2's son, who looks exactly like young Marty. Doing that bullshit you just said would do nothing because the point was to impersonate Marty Jr. Damn, I knew you were bad at watching movies, but you'd be CinemaSins at time travel. Why does he refer to all the other channels by their numbers, but ask specifically for the weather channel? No one cares, Jeremy. What would have been really funny is if you'd have pointed out that channel 63 is advertising inflatable tits at 5% off. Oh, that's right.